Hi folks, uh, this is uh, Richard Hall here and uh, welcome to the night, the night sky. Um, that's me just coming up there and I've, I've also got this other guy there. The oh, other guy. Yeah, yes, I'm always the other guy. <laughs> Keith yeah. Austin. I also yeah. like to thank Dan Browse and always sponsors this, this program. Uh, but before we get into the night sky at the moment, there's a couple of things I should tell you about. First of all, about Stonehenge. We've been very, very busy out there. We've been having a lot of things going on. Uh, at the moment, we're open 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. every day until the end of January, which is just about that now. Then from uh, February, it's going to be Wednesday to Sunday, uh, 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. So that's when we're open. And coming up in March, we've got Dave Flynn coming out there, uh, the program called The Celtic Guitar Journey. And uh, he apparently is absolutely brilliant. And he, he, when he came over, he demanded he wanted to play in the middle of Stonehenge. Okay, <laughs> so and that's going to happen on s 7 p.m. Thursday, March the 14th at Stonehenge RTO. Now, if you want to get tickets and sign, you can just simply phone up Stonehenge or any other uh, place around uh, the around the wire rapper that's dealing with that sort of thing. Okay? It promises to be quite a concert. It, yeah, it should be yes. a very good concert. Yeah. So. Yeah, don't miss out on that. So as I said, it's on uh, Thursday, uh, March the 14th. But do book in your tickets beforehand. OK, I'm not sure what the, the minimum are and uh, so on. Yeah, so we've got that. Anyway, let's get back out onto our night sky now. And um, we start off where we finish off really looking at last time. We're looking due north. And due north, of course, we've got a big bright star. And you can't miss it. That's actually the planet Jupiter dead easy to pick out but you'll notice that Jupiter is slowly changing its position in the sky from night to night so there's Jupiter there and the other constellation we so it's shifting against the background yeah, stars from one night right. to the next yes and we concentrated mostly on Orion but using Orion because it's so well known but using it as a signpost to find your way around the heavens because if you run in different lines you come to all these different bright stars we did that but we thought this time we should turn around and look away from Orion and look to the south. All right? And of course, once we look south, the, the most important constellation in the entire sky is the Southern Cross. All right? And there it is there. You know, he's watching it on TV. All right? And it is actually the smallest constellation in the entire sky. And why is it so important? Because the Southern Cross is a navigational beacon. And it has been for thousands of years. Let's have a look and see how it works. First of all, following behind are the two pointers, the two bright stars, because there's other crosses in the sky, but you can always know when you've got the Southern Cross, you've got the two pointers, okay? Now, the Southern Cross points to another star called Achenar. And it's dead easy to pick up because it's the only bright star in that region of the sky, all right? And if you come halfway in between Achenar and the Southern Cross, you come to the South Celestial Pole. Now, what's the South Celestial Pole? Well, that's the axis of the Earth projected into space. Yes. And as the Earth rotates, the entire heavens appear to rotate around that spot. So we can have a look at see what happens. So if you took the South Pole of the Earth, and it works with the North Pole too, by the way, and imagine a beam of light going all the way directly from the South Pole up into the sky from any from any place on Earth that would be the direction of the South C Celestial Pole. <coughs> That's right. Yes. Okay so and if you so if you drop from you that South Celestial Pole you drop to the horizon you're looking absolute due south all right so that's the reason why you use the Southern Cross because you can use it to find due south but it's more than that that South Celestial Pole is a number of degrees above the horizon equal to the latitude at which you're standing. Yes. So if you were standing at the South Pole, that, that South Celestial Pole would be directly overhead. Yes. Right? The, the imaginary would be, beam would be pointing yeah, straight So up. it would be 90 yes. degrees above the horizon. Yes. So you'll be standing at latitude 90. Here, if you measure it, it's 41 degrees. That's the latitude you're standing at the moment. So this is the spot in the sky the navigator loves to find because a it gives you your direction so once you've got due south you know where northeast and west is yes and it also gives you your latitude fortunately for us uh, we're looking at the south sky and we see in the summer remember that summer solstice 
and the, the Southern Cross is lying on its side. But what happens is that uh, gradually, over, over time, it moves around that South Celestial Pole. All right? So now we've moved to autumn, and we'll find that the Southern Cross is its highest point in the sky. All right? So that's what the southern and night sky would look like in autumn. Okay? It's also upright, yes. Yeah, that's right. I like to think of the um, south of the uh, cross rather um, as like the hand of a twenty-four hour clock, mm. because every night it takes one twenty-four hour period to uh, to circle around the pole. Mm. That's right, and uh, and then so. But each night it will move a slight bit from one night to the exactly. next. Exactly, right? so there's a slight the, discrepancy. We look at the autumn equinox yeah. now, and we move on from there. And winter night sky, we'll be looking at it like that. It's virtually the opposite of what we can see in the summer, all right? Where everything is to the left of the South Celestial Bowl, and, the, and of course the, um, the Milky Way and so on. So yes. there you are. And then we come round, doom, to spring, all right? And the Southern Cross is its lowest point in the sky. Mm. Now, the important thing is that stars beyond 41 degrees will rise and set. They will go below the rising up. But the, South Celeste, but the Southern Cross and Achenar are always above the horizon here. They're so now, any time it's clear, yes. you can find the, this spot. Okay? They're circumpolar stars, yes. Yeah. They never see it. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. yeah. And then we go back again, and we're back to the summer solstice position. Okay. As you can see, for those looking at it, you can see that the Southern Cross and the pointers are in the Milky Way. Uh, you can see some dark rifts and patches there as well. Uh, so let's go in and have a closer look at what it's all about. All right. Hello. <laughs> and that's what Richard looks like when <laughs> Hello, he's people. on TV. And that's what I look like when I'm on TV. Uh, there oh, we go. We've got on there. Good. <laughs> Thank you for that, Keith. Right. <laughs> OK. Now... I've, I've now placed a photograph in place there and you can see the beautiful colours of the Milky Way as well. We often tend to think that the night sky, the stars are all white stars, but they're not. They're all different colours. Mm. But the problem is your eye, and my eye as well, has two, two different cells it works from, what they're called rods, rods and cones. And cones yes. Okay. Yeah. Now, the rods give you black and white vision but they are the most sensitive so when things get dark at night your eye is mostly using the rods and that's why you don't you lose all the colors you mm. can normally see in the garden in the daytime because your eyes use the rods yes. it's only giving you black and white vision i like to think of it as uh, at night time all cats look gray yeah that's right yes. and the the cones give you color vision but they're not, no. as, they're not as sensitive yeah. as the rods. No. Right. So when you look at the night sky, there's not enough light coming from a star to trigger the cone cells. But the moment you look for a big telescope or you photograph, there is enough light coming through and you begin to see the colours. And you'll discover the stars are all different colours, which is related to the star's uh, temperature, surface temperature. Uh, our sun is a yellow star. Uh, orange and red stars are cooler, uh, white and blue stars are hotter, all right? Mm. So that's yeah. how it works out. So in the photograph now we can see the Southern Cross and the two pointer stars, all right? And there they are there. And what I thought we would do is go through and look at these as individual objects, yes. just the Southern yes. Cross. We're going to have a look what they're actually all about, all right? And one of those stars is uh, quite special. It's quite a famous star. We'll learn about that mm. in a moment. Mm. Okay. The bright star there, in fact, the brightest star in this panorama is Alpha Centauri. And it's famous because it is, in fact, the nearest star system beyond our solar system. Yeah. Okay. And its distance is just 4.3 light years. All right. And if we could go and have a closer look at that, we find that Alpha Centauri system is very different from that of the sun because you would have not one sun, but two. And these two suns orbiting around each other, the rough different distance between them is about the distance between the Sun and Saturn. But both of these stars are capable of supporting planets. In fact, we just recently discovered planets around these stars. Yes. Okay. And that's, that's amazing. Mm. Yes. Yeah. yeah. 
So, and so, but both of these stars, one's a little bit brighter than the sun, one's a little bit fainter, but they're both sun-like stars and could possibly support life and that sort of thing. So that's what we're interested about. And we just, keep the number we just talking about earlier, we've just got that point where the technology is such that we're able to detect worlds around other stars. Theoretically, I would guess that every star has got its own system of planets. It seems to planetary systems here seem to be a natural process of star formation. But of course, we couldn't prove it until now. Yeah. Now we begin to discover this. It seems to be a very common rank and file process. Most stars that uh, that we've looked at using new technology actually appear to have planets. Now, not all of these planets are Earth-like planets, of course. Some of them are gigantic planets bigger than our planet uh, Jupiter um, and um, but they're the first ones yeah, we're going to detect they're the first they're so ones big. That, we, that we found yeah. but we're starting to discover earth analogs mm. um, planets which are very much like earth in the right distance from their local sun as it is to hopefully have liquid water on, on yeah. their surfaces yeah. Yeah, no. So it's, it's, the discovery is going to be made in the near future, going to be absolutely amazing. Yes. Right? Yeah. So we looked, as we talked about earlier, you know, how many worlds are there out there like the Earth? Yeah. How many intelligent big species yes. will have to wait well, and find Well, you have liquid water, you can have life. <laughs> yes. Now, the other point of star is Hadar. It's also known as Agena. And its distance is virtually... What's that? <laughs> About 19 times further away, <laughs> 20 times, it's 391 light years away. You see, when we're looking at the stars, we've got no concept of, except with the stars close to us or further away, mm. you know, because they all vary in brightness as well. So you've got Alpha Centauri, just over four light years away, and the so called pointer star, all right, uh, next to it, which is 391 light years away. Yes. Uh, and this. You can, you can, for those who look on TV, you can see a difference in colour. It's blue in colour. And indeed, Hadar is a, what we call a blue giant star. And wait for it, it's 66,100 times brighter than the sun. Okay. That's very hot yeah. when you think of it. Yeah. Yes. And most of that energy from that star is actually being uh, thrown out in the UV. So even a planet like Pluto around this star would be molten. Uh, an Earth-like planet couldn't exist. Yes. But furthermore, what we, we won't go into it too much now, but we'd, the big bright stars are actually very short-lived. So even if they got worlds there, they could never live yes. long enough to perpetuate their, life. Their yeah. size makes them burn hotter, mm. and so they run through their fuel faster yeah. than a smaller star would, yes. Yeah, that's yeah. right. So Hadar uh, is complete opposite to what Agena is. And of course, you, ca you can't tell that when you're just looking up in the sky. And of course, in the ancient world, that's what our ancestors were, just looking up these points of light in the sky. Yes. Didn't yeah. know what they were, you right. know? Okay, so let's go back now. Next one we're going to have a look at is we're going to move to the actual Southern Cross itself. And the brightest star in the Southern Cross is called Acrux. And it, it comes, that name actually comes from Alpha Crucis because Crucis means the Southern Cross and Alpha means it's the brightest star there. It's yes. also known as Tipunga, right, by Maori, okay? And its distance is also enormous distance from us. It's 320 light years. So that's a crux. Now let's have a look in close. If we imagine, this is an artist's impression, is actually what you see as one star is in fact a system of four stars. There we are. <laughs> right. It's actually a system of four stars, right? And the, the bigger, brighter pair uh, orbit around each other, they're virtually touching. Uh, one of them is 25,000 times brighter than the sun, and the other is 16,000 times brighter. Yeah. But these are all hot blue stars, massive stars, okay? So that's a crux, right? Looking on from there, we, there's a crux. But an interesting thing is that if you look, you can actually see it with a pair of binoculars, there appears to be another star which is right next to a crux, okay? It's called Tupper. But it's nothing to do with uh, Alpha Crucis, all right? Uh, as you can see, the difference is that uh, a crux is 320 light years away, but Tupper is only 126 light years away. Yeah. It's just in the same line of sight that we're looking at. Yes. Okay. Yeah. 
it's and very very similar to looking down a road and you can see all the street lights and they're all dis different distances from you but from your perspective they all appear to be on a flat uh, yeah, background if, if you could only yes. see the lights yes. and that's the problem we've got with the stars yes. we've got no idea when two things are close together where they are physically close together or just yes. different distances and so on so that's a crux there and tupper right Okay, and Tuffer itself is, is quite interesting. It's 126 light years away, and it's a star a little, a little bit bigger and a little bit brighter than the sun. It's about twice as bright as the sun, right? And it's, it's got an age of just 2.17 giga years. That means about half the age of the sun, right? Yeah. But the interesting thing is, it's one of the first places where we discovered a planet beyond the solar system. And Tupper has got a, uh, <coughs> excuse me, folks, it's got a planet which it orbits around it. It's got a mass of 75 times that of the sun, Earth. So this is a giant planet, a bit the same sort of, <coughs> excuse me, folks, a bit the same as uh, the mass of Saturn. It's a bit, a bit smaller yes. than Saturn, but it's certainly a lot massive. So it's almost certainly a solar gas giant planet, and yes. it orbits around it in a period of 11 days. And that was discovered by measuring the very subtle wobble of the star oh. as the planet orbits around it. Yeah. Is that right? That's yes. right, yeah. Yes. It's a, yeah. one of the first discovered. So there you are. Right, and I do have that. There may be lots of other planets there, but that's one we've managed to discover. But a bit, a bit unlike the giant planets in our solar system, it's it's orbiting very, very close. It's closer to this its sun than Mercury is to our sun. Yeah. So this is a giant planet. So it'd be probably the the side of it facing the star will probably be red hot. It'll be roasted. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. Anyway, ha having said that, um, what do you think if we get Kate? Keith, uh, give us a, a little tiny tune. Yeah. To you manage well, I've got, my, I've got my flute here. I haven't done a lot of uh, music work uh, on, uh, on wind instruments. But um, anyway, so... Um, let's do a little bit of adjusting. But, uh, here we go. <laughs> is called Mimosa, right? And it's got a distance of 280 light years. It too you can see is a bluish colour, and indeed it turns out that it's two stars virtually in suns virtually in contact. Yes. Which are orbiting around each other, right, in a period of five years, and together they're 34,000 times brighter than the sun. Yes. And Folks, don't get the wrong impression. Our sun is not a feeble star, all right? It's just that when we're looking up at the big bright stars in the sky, we're looking at the giants. And we see these giants because they shine out over vast distances. In fact, the vast majority of the stars in our galaxy, the sun is actually brighter than them, all right? It's just that when we look out at night, the stars that stand out are those big bright ones. And it's very much the same as when you look out across the paddock and you, you see the, uh, the cattle out there, mm. but you don't see the thousands of other 
smaller creatures that are there, right? Yes, yeah. the worms yeah. and the insects and, yeah. uh, and the bacteria and all that sort of that's thing. That's right, so we, we, well, we just yes. get a yeah. very yeah. Yeah. minimised view of it, yeah. okay? So that's, that's mimosa there. And I've just pulled out a little tiny dot and... Uh, And that shows you our sun alongside uh, Mimosa, okay? <laughs> yeah, looks a little yes. bit small. And of course, it will be considerably fainter than that, right? Okay. The interesting thing with Mimosa, though, is its age. We've managed it's only 10 million years old. Now, you might think that's a pretty ancient star. <laughs> Yeah. But, uh, no, sorry, by um, stellar terms, that's slow. You've got to remember our sun is four and a half billion years old yes so, so this is like a real baby right it it, 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 it it's a teenage star it's, it's not a, even teenage it's an I, it, I think it's, it's still in its nappies mate yeah, yeah. okay yeah. Uh, but this is what we'll find a lot of these blue stars that they're all been born recently mm. and this tends us we in a region of the sky where star birth is taking place okay next to mimosa is what I first of all appears like a to be another star but in binoculars you can see it's not a star and in telescope it's one of the most magnificent objects you can look at right it comes up I'm bringing it up now this is known the as the jewel box, box yes. okay and it's actually a cluster of stars and by cluster I mean not only together they are physically bound together it's over a hundred stars Right. They're bound and together by their mutual gravity. That's right. And, yes. uh, and you've got the big bright stars there and you've got the blue stars, but you've also got a red giant there. And when you look at it through the telescope, the contrast of the colours of the red star, the blue stars and so on, it looks right. absolutely... That's why it was called the jewel box. Called the jewel box, yeah. yes. yes. Notice also that it's, uh, for those who are watching this on there, its age is also 10 million years, right? The whole yeah. of that cluster. And eventually with time... Look, I should point out to you, all stars have formed in clusters. But with the passage of time as it travels around the galaxy, the clusters disintegrate. So yes. our sun would have been part of a cluster one. Yes, somewhere in the galaxy is the twin, possibly, of our, of yeah, our own our sun. Our brothers and sisters, yes. yeah, out yeah. there somewhere. But also, don't, you've got to get the distance. We talked about the Mimosa, for example, being 280 light years away. Well, the jewel box, its distance is 6,419 light years. Yes. It's an enormous <laughs> distance away, yes. okay? Yeah. So, as I say, you, you've got to put it all into perspective. I'll try and do that at the end. Right. Then we've got the crux. It's different from the other big bright stars there in that it's got a definitely orangey-red colour. It's only 88, I say only, it's 88 light years away. And it is what we call a red giant star. And it's 820 times brighter than the sun. Mm. But a, a short while ago, and I'm talking about a short while, a few million years ago, it was actually another one, another blue giant. And what's happened, it's evolved, and it's now turned into a red star. It's expanded. Yes, got big, exactly. Big, yes. And has become a red yeah. star. Yeah. yeah. But it, it too is a, uh, a binary star, consisted of two suns. Its companion... You can see the upper right corner for those of you watching on TV. It's a bluey white star, uh, but the crux once upon a time would have been similar to that star, but a little bit brighter, all right? Mm, but yep. it's now aged, and eventually the other one will turn into a red giant as well, and so we'll have two red giants. Yes. Now, someone was asking me a little while ago about the, uh, the actual letters that uh, classify the stars. Um, uh, Gacrux, for example, as you can see on the TV screen, it's classed as an M43, it's a Roman numeral 3 star, and someone was asking me about this, and just, just briefly, um, the really hot bright stars are in the category O or B or whatever, um, as they get cooler and redder, uh, they go from blue down to red, uh, you go from O to B, then A, then F, then G, which is our sun, and that's sort of the middle of the road, and then you get the uh, the, uh, the really cool stars, uh, the K, uh, K and the M stars, and they tell you the colour and also the temperature of the star. It's a rather crazy sort of an alphabet, but it evolved that way due to uh, the way it was, the things were discovered. And the three, the Roman numeral three, tells you that it's a... 
um, it's, a, it's a red giant star. It's not uh, one of the main sequence stars that right. uh, our sun is yeah. a member of. Yeah. Yep. And you can see its companion is A3, right? Yeah. Okay. Now, next, we've gone to the fourth star of the Southern Cross, Imar. Its distance is 346 light years. All right. It too is another blue giant, 10,000 times brighter than the sun, but it's also variable. All right. And it means it's pulsating, changing in color. And that yes. probably is a good indication that it's going to turn into a red giant. Yes. No. When you say variable, uh, how frequently does it pulse, Richard? Yeah. Well, I, I haven't got the details on that, but yeah. there, there's all different types. Maybe we should do a program on different types of variable yes. stars. But yes. yeah, it would be a pulsating star. But yes. it won't, it would, the, the variation is not enormous or large, but it mm. shows there is instability there. Yes. Okay. Now, people, some people say, oh, there's always five stars in the Southern <laughs> Cross, not four. Oh, okay. We'll look at the fourth, fifth one. It's Ginan. Its different distance is 230 light years. And for those of you watching this on TV, you can see that it's got a reddy colour as well, which is true. It's a red giant star. Yes. Okay. And it's 302 times brighter than the sun. 302. The reason why I can say it's 300 rather than, rather than 300, it's 302. These latest measurements are by things like the Hubble Space Telescope, the Webb Telescope, where we're yep. really accurately getting the distances of these stars. So there's another red giant. Okay. And next to the uh, Ginan is, um, is a nebula, beautiful nebula. This is a, a glowing cloud of gas and dust. It's also the same distance, 229 light years away. And it's reflecting, the, the gas and dust is reflecting the light of nearby stars. Yes. So white stars actually, uh, actually most of their energy is coming out in the green part of the spectrum. And so that's what you're seeing there. Okay. Yeah, that's, um, that'll be an infrared photograph uh, taken by the IRS infrared star mm. telescope. And so it's actually what they call false colour. Those are not its natural colours. But if you could see, if you had infrared eyes, that's how you would see the nebula. Mm. Yes. Right. Because, but the most notable thing which you can easily see with the unaided eye is looking next to the Southern Cross, you can see this black patch in the sky, the coal sack. So let's have a closer look at the coal sack there. There it is there. And this is a dark molecular cloud. It's simply a cloud. This is the raw material from which new stars are formed. Eventually, there will be a star cluster there. Its, its distance is 600 light years, and it's almost 70 light years in diameter across. And this is a dark cloud, and it's simply laying in between us and the more distant stars. It's of those stars that you can see on the uh, coal sack are closer to us than the coal yes. sack itself. And it's, so this it's just, is, and it's just made of... Uh, huge amounts of dust and gas and yeah. all the primordial stuff that one day stars and planets will be, will be made yeah. of. Yes. But look, folks, the coal sack is dead easy to see on a good night because you've got the rest of the Milky Way around it. It really stands out. So do go and have yes. a look at the Southern Cross and check that out. OK, the, the picture we've got up at the moment is the Southern Cross as we see it from here. I'm going to bring you up another picture looking at the Southern Cross at right angles if we were right out in space and we look at it from a different angle. So what we're going to do, I'll bring that up now, there it is there, the arrow shows you where the Earth is and the other end we're 400 light years away. So now we're looking at all those bright stars but not as we see them in the sky but yes. in their distance. Now that's from a very three-dimensional effect. So this would time. mean that yes. it would be very much like seeing it from you know, a side on as it were, yeah. the whole thing. And you yes. can so you immediately see the patterns, so-called constellations, immediately yes. change around, depending yeah. on the angle you look at it. OK, just to work out who they are, first of all, you've got Alpha Centauri there, which is the closest one. And incidentally, Hadar, all right, is actually the most distant of all those stars. Yeah. So we've got the closest and most distant in the Hadar uh, 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 pointer stars. Then we've got Acrux. And next to it, Tupper, which is a long much closer to us, okay. Then Mimosa, Gekrux, which is close to us, okay, relatively speaking, okay. Yes. And then Amaya over there, more, yeah. more distant. So as you can see, 
depending on the angle at which you look at things from mm. this space, the whole pattern will start. So if you were out in another star system, you wouldn't see the same constellations we see from exactly, here. Yes. It would all be different. And so this on. brings to mind the, uh, the, the amazing story, and I'd like to talk about this one day, uh, Richard, of actually how we measure the distances to the stars. Oh, yeah. And, yeah. It, and it's, it's, vast, it's vastly intriguing. There's quite a bit of human history involved in it too. Mm. Yeah. Oh, it's not as easy as you think. No, <laughs> that's right. Oh, I've met, left one out, Ginan. <laughs> okay, there. Right, okay. Right. Then finally, we're just about winding up. We've got, I should tell you, so Akanar, which means river's end. It's part of the constellation, which means the great river in the sky. And it's Iridanus. the last one. Yes. That's Akanar. All right, its distance is 144 light years. And once again, we've got a, a blue giant star yes. there, 3,150 times brighter than the sun. Okay, so there you go. And finally, I should finish show off without saying the brightest star in the sky, second brightest star in the entire sky is Canopus, which is in our southern sky, 310 light years away. Yes. All right. And, and at the moment, it. Canopus is almost directly yeah. overhead. Yes. Awesome object. Okay, we're going to have to shut up now. <laughs> so there's our sun to scale, not to scale, there's our sun to scale now. Okay, so having said that, folks, uh, just to remind you, we've got Dave Flynn coming up in March. I'll be talking about that later. And having said that, I'm going to close down. <laughs>